Hey class, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're covering contemporary perspectives and personality. And I've already addressed the trait theories in a prior lecture, video lecture. Um, so that is the first contemporary perspective of personality that's covered in the module. So I just wanted to revisit that quickly. Uh, you recall the uh, big five factor theory is kind of the most well-accepted trait theory today. Um, Cross-cultural evidence suggests that uh, these are major personality categories um, that could do a pretty good job summarizing uh, a person's major personality characteristics, just using these five categories or factors. The heritability estimate for these five factors uh, vary somewhat depending on the population that you study. Um, but I want to clarify one more time what a heritability estimate is. The heritability estimate is not an estimate on what percentage of your of uh, your traits come from your genes. It's uh, that's that's a little more complicated than we can compute. Uh, so the heritability estimate is the genetic contribution to the variations of a trait uh, among people. So for example, some of you are really uh, outgoing and sociable, and some of you are not very outgoing and sociable. Uh, if the heritability estimate for that trait was uh, 0.5, then we would say that uh, about half of the difference in, in the, or half of the variability in how sociable people are can be explained by the different genetic contributions that they have and the other half could be explained by the different life experiences that they've had. But the heritability estimate for the big five factors overall is, is in the ballpark of 0.50. Um, the bigger question though I think is how stable are these five factors? And uh, there's some longitudinal data from a, a study. So longitudinal studies is when they uh, select a group of people to participate in the study and they study that same group of people over a long period of time. And this particular longitudinal study showed some trends in people's scores on the big five factors. So you can see from the image there that for both males and females, conscientiousness tends to increase over time. Now remember, conscientiousness means like being dependable and reliable and organized and neat. Um, so what that tells us is that from age 21 to age 60, when the uh, last data was collected, that these people in general, all of them, uh, seem to become more conscientious. And that, that could be a genetic influence that affects us later in life, but more than likely it's just uh, life circumstances. Those are experiences. Uh, as you get older and you have uh, careers and, and maybe a family and a mortgage and uh, important bills to pay, uh, you kind of have to become more dependable and more responsible. So that's probably why that occurs. But I'm not going to go through and describe uh, and uh, have a discussion about all of them, but just kind of note that um, some of the traits uh, seem to decline a little bit, like neuroticism for women tends to decrease from age 21 to age 60, at least in this sample. Uh, men, on average, for neuroticism, uh, scored lower than women to begin with, and uh, their neuroticism scores were relatively stable over time. If you look at uh, openness to experience, or just sometimes called openness, um, men scored a little bit higher than women, uh, not significantly though. So in this sample, men were a little bit more open-minded than women. Um, and up to age 60, those scores were relatively stable. I mean, they for both groups, men and women, they declined a little bit, but not significantly. So, uh, you know, maybe we can conclude from that that uh, if you're open-minded, however open-minded you are right now at your age, uh, 18, 20, 21, whatever, that you're probably going to be uh, about the same um, when you get older, like at age 60. Same thing for extroversion, uh, or the flip side of that, which would be introversion. Uh, although women are a little more extroverted than men to begin with, um, but overall, by the time uh, people reach their 60s, 
they're about the same in terms of their uh, extroversion score. So that's a trait that doesn't seem to uh, change too much. The two that really have a noticeable increase though were uh, conscientiousness and agreeableness. Uh, people tended to become more agreeable, easier to get along with um, as they got older. Although it is kind of interesting that right at the age of 60 for agreeableness, you can see those scores starting to de decrease a little bit. So maybe there's something to the old stereotype that uh, elderly people are crabby. I don't know. Maybe. But I think all in all, uh, in terms of real life um, situations, we, you know, have to consider that the relationships we have with people, whether they're friendships or love relationships, um, you know, sometimes we have relationships with people who have traits that we aren't real fond of. Um, you know, you probably should never expect that person to change because we know some of these traits are relatively stable. Um, so, you know, if you're dating somebody at age 19 or 18 or 20, uh, and this is a person who likes to go out and party a lot and be with their friends a lot, and, and you're more of an introvert maybe, uh, don't expect that person to change uh, when you put a ring on the finger or uh, sometimes people say, well, I'm sure once we have kids, uh, you know, that'll change. But, you know, it's possible it might, but don't, you should never bank on major personality characteristics changing because um, some of them are relatively stable. One of the topics I'm introducing from a, a different module here, uh, as you can see, module 33, uh, page 414, be, and I'm doing that because it ties in so well with personality, and that is personality types, type A and type B personalities, and you can probably predict pretty well if you're a type A or a type B or maybe right kind of in the middle somewhere, but uh, it is interesting that type A people have higher rates of heart disease, and that's probably because of uh, a lifetime of uh, the kinds of things that contribute to heart disease. Type A people are kind of uh, really taskmasters. They like to keep busy. They like to achieve things. They like to, uh, they're driven by success. Uh, and with all that comes uh, stress, uh, maybe high blood pressure accompanies that, high cholesterol perhaps. And so um, not surprisingly, um, about 65% of adults who have heart disease also have type A uh, behavior personalities. So the biggest factor though that contributes to coronary heart disease among type A people is the anger and hostility. Those are the two key features of type A uh, personalities that contribute to heart disease. Uh, there are some type A people who do not have a lot of anger and hostility. Their risk for heart disease is really no different than type B people. And as, as you can see the type B people are kind of laid back and easygoing. Um, Type B people generally have low scores on neuroticism on the big five. Like They don't get too stressed out about things. They just kind of take things uh, in stride and kind of handle things as they go. They stay pretty calm in tense situations. So, all right. So uh, you think about where you fall in line with that. Remember, anytime you can apply something to your own life, uh, you'll get it encoded in memory a little better, and you can retrieve that information better. So take some time. Uh, to really think about whether you're a type A or type B and maybe some reasons why you think that. So I am uh, I am kind of both. I'm kind of right in the middle on all of the scores I've ever taken, for, uh, the inventories I've taken for type A and type B. I definitely know I'm very impatient uh, and that is one type A characteristic that I have. I hate, might have mentioned that in a previous lecture as well, but um, I hate waiting in lines. I hate driving places when even if drivers are going just a little bit under the speed limit uh, that really bothers me and it's not that I'm a speed racer or anything but I just like to get from one point to another as efficiently as possible and uh, my life focuses a lot on efficiency <laughs> and when that gets interrupted I get frustrated pretty easily so that's one of those traits that I try to work on uh, because I would I would rather not be an impatient person because it does nothing but cause distress for me but um and uh, I can handle that pretty well most of the times but uh, but my tendency my natural tendency is to is to get frustrated easily 
when I have to wait for other people and, and such. So, all right, moving on. Um, one of my favorite perspectives on psychology is um, called reciprocal determinism, which I'm going to come to in a little bit. But it's, it's a social cognitive perspective, which kind of takes a blend of um, what's going on in our social environment, the situations we're in, but also what's going on privately, cognitively, your internal attributes. And um, I like this one because it explains a lot about how our behavior can change depending on situations we're in. We talked about that a little bit earlier, how our, our personality traits are relatively stable, but, but we can control how talkative we are uh, depending on situations we're in and such. And that's what I love about this theory because it does account for both stability and flexibility in our behavior. It comes from Albert Bandura. He calls it reciprocal determinism because his idea is that each of these three things, uh, the environments or situations we're in, your internal or personal attributes, and your actual behaviors, that they all influence each other. And those are uh, all come to determine like how you behave. And sometimes these influences are uh, similar over situations and we behave similarly. That would explain why sometimes our behavior is pretty consistent. Our personality traits can be consistent. But uh, also sometimes we find ourselves in situations that require us to adjust our behavior. And that's why we're not 100% uh, extroverted in every situation, for example. So uh, I'd like to go through an example just to kind of make a point here about how uh, he views this. So let's just say, um, let's take one factor in the internal factors. So let's, let's go with this belief. Let's say we have somebody who believes that they're no good in math. And it is a common belief that people who struggle in math, they'll say like, I just, I'm just no good in math. Well, if that's your belief, then how does that belief impact your behavior? So let's consider. You think you're no good in math. You're at home working on math homework. How persistent are you when you come to a difficult problem? And as you can imagine, if you think you're no good in math, you probably give up easily. You probably check the solutions in the back of the book more quickly, and you don't really challenge yourself. How does that belief also affect your behavior in the classroom when you're taking math classes? Are you paying close attention? Are you asking questions, et cetera, et cetera? And if you have that low belief, you probably aren't working as hard. You're probably not pushing yourself as hard. Uh, and you're not asking questions. You're not paying as close of attention. You're giving up easily on difficult problems. So then you get in the situation, if your teacher in that situation notices that you aren't paying attention, their belief might be that you're unmotivated. And so they don't ask you questions and they don't challenge you. Then you take a test which would also be part of this environment and situations, and you do poorly on the test. Well, that just kind of reinforces your belief that you're no good in math. And the cycle continues, or you're not working hard, you do poorly in your math class, and you continue believing that you're no good in math. So what happens if, um, let's take a personality trait. Let's say somebody who's really shy and they have a hard time dating. Uh, they're not really comfortable talking to people. So how does shyness impact your behavior when you're around other people? Well, they tend not to make uh, very much eye contact. They tend not to initiate conversations with people. How do people in those environments react to that? Well, they notice that you're shy. So um, they probably don't initiate conversations with you. Think, oh, that person looks shy. They look like they don't want to talk, so I won't talk to them. And then uh, what does that do to your belief? Uh, because you don't have practice talking with people, uh, your shyness just kind of continues. And the point also is that, remember, these can go the other way. So if you're shy, what kind of situations or environments do you seek out normally when you have a choice? Well, shy people tend not to go to places where there's a ton of people that they have to talk to. So how does that affect their behavior? Well, then they're not practicing talking to people, um, which just kind of reinforces their shy personality trait. 
But as we mentioned earlier, there are situations, uh, and sometimes things do change. So situations can change us, and sometimes uh, relatively permanent changes. So, um, you know, most shy people do end up uh, in love relationships. They're not all single for their whole life. So at some point, they must be in some kind of a situation where they feel comfortable enough uh, talking to somebody, uh, and that person uh, responds back to them, uh, which reinforces or which maybe changes their shyness a little bit. And likewise, there are some people who think they're bad in math, uh, but eventually um, come to realize that they're better than they thought. So maybe you have that belief that you're bad in math, but maybe you have a particular teacher that notices that, but has higher expectations of you. And that teacher decides he's gonna, he's gonna call on you a lot more and then you're forced to answer questions. Maybe that teacher tells you to come to his office to meet with him or to meet with you after class. Maybe he gives you a little bit of one-on-one -on -one, uh, help. Uh, and the next thing you know, you take a quiz and you do a little bit better than usual and you adjust your belief a little bit. And you say, you know, maybe I'm not as good, maybe I'm not as bad as math than I thought. Then you go home and you decide to work a little bit harder on your math you decide to start paying better attention in class, maybe you start taking better notes, you take another quiz, you do pretty good on it, and now your belief is continuing to change. Uh, and therein lies, I think, the beauty of this um, reciprocal determinism, this view of personality, is that, as I mentioned earlier, it accounts for uh, why some traits are relatively stable, but it can also account for changes uh, in our personality. So just to kind of uh, rehash that, the reciprocal determinism means that what determines your, your behavior is the reciprocal influence that each of these three things have on each other. One of the important factors that could fall into this category, and I've listed some of them there, that's not completely comprehensive by any means, one of them uh, is called the locus of control, which I'm bringing from another module as well because it fits really well here. Uh, the locus of control is from module 34. Um, the locus of control is your belief um, in what controls your destiny, basically. So if you have an internal locus of control, you feel like you're in charge of your destiny. What happens to you is your doing. So your personality traits, your effort, your intelligence, your abilities, your work ethic, those are all internal traits or internal attributes. And if you have an internal locus of control, you think about those things a lot in terms of why things turn out the way in your life that they do. If you have an external locus of control, you generally feel like things beyond your control determine the outcomes in your life. So fate, luck, chance, other people, situational factors uh, impact your life more than you have any control over. The significance of the locus of control is that people with an internal locus of control seem to be the type of people who take more action to get things done or to achieve things in their life. Uh, so for example, let's say you have an internal locus of control and you do well on a test. You might say to yourself, well, I worked hard. I deserve that grade. Uh, I studied hard or I'm smart. And those are all internal factors. What happened there is that you achieved something or you experienced some success and you gave yourself credit for that success, which will be good for your self-esteem, your self-worth. Somebody with an external locus of control might do well on a test and say, oh, I must have got lucky or, oh, the teacher must have made that test really easy. And the problem with that is when you, when you achieve something and you have an external locus of control, is you don't give yourself credit for that. So you don't benefit, your self-esteem or self-worth doesn't benefit much from your successes. Now, of course, everybody experiences failure at times. So if you have an internal locus of control and you get a bad test score, what they tend to, what people with an internal locus of control tend to think to themselves is, oh, I, I must not have tried hard enough. I'll try harder next time. 
And so you can see the benefits of that locus of control is feeling like, oh, I have control over my grade. I just have to work harder. But that's something you can change, perhaps. And a person with an external locus of control might do poorly on a test and say, well, there's nothing I can do about that. The teacher just makes the test too hard. Or the teacher doesn't do a good enough job teaching me. And again, kind of like they have no control over what, what happens in their life. So in psychology, we like for people to have more of an internal locus of control. Now, sometimes uh, students would question, question the results. Um, I used to have students do an inventory online, and they had to write a reflection paper about the results. And some students would have an internal locus of control, but would disagree with the results. They would disagree because they would say, well, I think God controls my destiny. And, and, uh, and I wouldn't question someone's belief in that by any means. But what we would say is, but you both, even if you think God controls your destiny, um, you still look both ways when you cross the street. So, like, there's a contradiction there. If you think God controls your destiny, yet you still do things to protect, your, you still take an internal approach to, you know, checking your safety. You could think, like, some people say, like, like sometimes when people are uh, heavy smokers and somebody will say, you know, that's bad for your health. And sometimes a smoker will say something like, well, you know, God will control when it's, God will determine when it's my time to go. And that's the justification they use to continue smoking is like, well, God has control over that, so I might as well just go ahead and smoke and smoke. Oh, maybe. But if that's the case, and statistically speaking, for some reason, God wants smokers in heaven sooner than non-smokers because he takes them at an earlier age. And the point is, an internal locus of control person would say, you know, this smoking is bad for my health. Uh, I don't like the way I feel. Uh, therefore, I'm going to make changes. I have control over this. I'm going to stop smoking. Uh, I'm going to eat healthier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The locus of control can vary somewhat depending on different different areas or domains of your life. So, for example, uh, when it comes to academic success, most students have an internal locus of control. Most students will will say most of your success in college is due to your work ethic, being organized, making sure you study, etc., etc. When it comes to physical health, sometimes that might be a, a little different. For the same, the same person might say, well, yeah, it's mostly internal because you can choose what you want to eat, you can choose how often you exercise, you make choices to go to the doctor when you're not feeling well, but at the same time, we also recognize that there are some things that you get, maybe through genetics, that can cause illnesses that you have virtually no control over. And that's just a reality. You could apply that same mindset to mental health issues, uh, psychological disorders. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, figuring out ways to deal with stress uh, is, is something that you have under your control that can have a big impact on your mental health. But there's also some disorders that have st very strong genetic links, uh, or maybe sometimes people are in situations where they just literally don't have a lot of control over what's going on that could impact their mental health as well. So the point is, uh, depending on different domains of your life, your locus of control can vary somewhat. Sometimes Some domains might be more internal, some might be a little more external. But overall, we all have a general level of uh, locus of control. Like all these specific domains kind of average into your overall locus of control as well. The last topic I'm going to talk about from the module is self-esteem. And uh, self-esteem is really um, whether you value yourself or not, whether you like yourself or not. And uh, over the years, there's been a big push uh, well, really, it started back in the 80s. It's so what we, in psychology, we call it the self-esteem movement. And it was kind of a point where we recognized that people with high self-esteem tended to achieve greater things. And so the idea was uh, 
well, if we can teach people to have high self-esteem, then they can achieve better. Uh, unfortunately, um, that was a directionality issue at play there. If you remember that from earlier in this semester, um, does variable 1 cause variable 2, or does variable 2 cause variable 1? And what it actually turned out to be, uh, as we discovered uh, a decade later, is that high self-esteem does not cause higher achievement. In fact, what it is is achieving things causes higher self-esteem. And unfortunately, though, in the 80s, um, people misconstrued uh, those results, uh, especially the way it was reported in the media. Schools, some schools banned uh, teachers from using red ink because it was too negative and it would hurt the child's self-esteem. There were all kinds of goofy initiatives going on. Um, some schools banned honor roll because it would make the kids who didn't make honor roll feel bad about themselves. And uh, we started seeing, which we still see today in youth sports, um, participation ribbons, participation trophies. Everyone gets an award. Um, no scores being kept in youth sports. We don't want kids to feel bad if they lose. It kind of got way blown out of proportion. Uh, and we still see some of the remnants from that movement. What we know today, though, is that uh, achieving things will help your self-esteem to grow. And so our goal, uh, particularly with young children, is is not to praise them lavishly, but, but rather to uh, help them achieve things. And um, But you don't have to achieve great things to have high self-esteem. Um, the, the big thing with self-esteem is that that kids can learn that they're not perfect, that kids should learn that they're gonna make mistakes, and a kid with high self-esteem will pick himself back up off the ground and say, that's all right, uh, I don't expect to be perfect, I don't expect to win every time, I'm gonna pick myself back up and I'm gonna try again. Um, that's that's a sign of a healthy or uh, secure self-esteem. A healthy or secure self-esteem and those kids are um, kind of like when we talked about Carl Rogers, when you stop worrying about, you know, trying to please other people and just kind of be yourself and follow your own path in life. Um, and these are the, you know, the kind of kids who can say like, yeah, I'm not perfect and I'm okay with that. Um, but I still like myself because, you know, if I value hard, hard work, then I'm going to get up and I'm going to work hard again and I'll give it another try. Uh, even if I don't succeed. There was a, a famous successful person, and I wish I could remember who this was. I just know it was somebody who, uh, who was the CEO of a major corporation uh, of some kind. But he said one time that uh, in life he's fallen down. Uh, 2,000 times he's fallen down in life, but he's gotten back up 2,001 times. And I always felt like that's kind of the, uh, a sign of somebody with a, a healthy self-esteem is that they're not afraid to try something and fail, um, but they'll get back up and, and try again, and they don't give up. So um, with that healthy self-esteem, you don't expect everyone to love you. You don't expect everyone to admire you, but you're okay with that because you kind of like who you are. And remember, you know like you're not perfect. You know you some people see you as weird sometimes maybe or some people maybe think you're not the most attractive person in the world or whatever but you can be okay with that um, unfortunately uh, what we have uh, are sometimes people with low self-esteem so people who don't like themselves and uh, that of course is a concern and uh, one way uh, parents can help kids is to um, you know congratulate kids on their work ethic on trying even if they're not successful but you don't want to go overboard with the praise and praise them for every dumb little thing they do because kids are smart enough to recognize pretty quickly that they haven't deserved that praise so you know sometimes parents do go overboard and you know say hey let's go uh, let's go good job putting your shoes on you know they praise their kids for this you know silly little things like that which doesn't even affect the kid because um, you know, putting your shoes on should not be something to congratulate a 10-year-old over, you know. Now, if your kid's just learning how to dress himself, that'd be different, you know. But um, but the other big problem we have is that some people have 
really high self-esteem, but it's very fragile. These tend to be the people we consider to be kind of narcissistic. And there seems to be an increase in the number of narcissistic people um, over the years, uh, partly due to the self-esteem movement from the 80s, just where parents have just gone overboard praising their kids for every little thing. We also have social networking that uh, kids, you know, are spend a lot of time taking pictures of themselves. Um, you know, they'll maybe only post the most, the best pictures of themselves for other people to see. They don't want people to see any pictures of them where they look kind of goofy or anything. And it all ends up leading to this high self-esteem, but it's not really based on any merits or anything that they've achieved. So uh, deep down inside, they know this. And so people with this high but fragile self-esteem can be very defensive. So it's kind of like if you have healthy self-esteem and this is your self-esteem and somebody says you're a jerk, uh, you know, that comment might dent your self-esteem a little bit, but your self-esteem will pop back into shape. If you have a really fragile self-esteem and somebody says you're a jerk, it starts to crack. It starts to crack and your self-esteem, you feel so challenged. You don't have anything to go on to counteract that in your mind to say that person's wrong. Um, and so what happens is they get really defensive because they have to protect this fragile self-esteem that they have built. And uh, these are the kinds of people that we say um, can actually be kind of violent and dangerous at times because if you if you uh, do something to, to pop their little self-esteem bubble, they can lash out violently. Oftentimes, kids who go to school um, and attack their classmates, um, it's true that a lot of times they are outcast, social outcasts or teased, but a lot of those kids also have high self-esteem that's very fragile. And one of the reasons they lash out violently is because their classmates tease them and they don't know how to handle that. Um, their self-esteem comes crashing down. That was the case with the Columbine shooters. Uh, they were actually very high on themselves. The shooters were uh, Dylan and Eric. Uh, those two boys thought really highly of themselves. And one of the reasons they got so mad uh, with other people is because when they got made fun of, um, they didn't know how to let that bounce off of their self-esteem. Um, and their self-esteem start to crumble. They have to protect that by uh, by being lashing out at others and trying to eliminate the source of anything that will um, threaten their self-esteem. So, so I'm going to close this out with a short little video. Uh, it's about three and a half minutes long. It's some famous research by Carol Dweck, uh, and she's uh, studied self-esteem a lot, uh, especially in children. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this short video. We took fifth graders. We give them puzzles to solve. So you see these blocks? Can you tell me what color is on that side? Red, yellow, white, blue. All right, so what I want you to do is put these blocks together so that the picture on top matches the picture here, all right? First, we give children a set of easier puzzles to do. Now, here's the next one. When these nine and 10 year olds successfully put together the puzzle, the children are praised for either their intelligence. Wow, you did really well. You must be really smart at this. Or the effort they made. Wow, you did really well. You must have tried really hard at these. Then we give them a much harder set of problems, ones that they might, in fact, struggle with. Here's the next one. And we see what happens to their confidence? Do they think, oh, this means I'm not good at it after all? Do they stop liking the puzzles? Or do they maintain their confidence and think, well, it just needs more effort or strategy? What happens to their motivation? You ready to go on? Ta-da! <laughs> we also ask them, well, what, which problems do you want to work on some more? those easier ones or those harder ones. And generally we find that the kids who have been praised for their intelligence 
really want to go back to those easier ones that were their, kind of their claim to fame. This is a sign of a fixed mindset, the belief that intelligence is innate and can't be changed. What we found was that children thought that that difficulty meant they weren't smart or they weren't good at the task. So you seem to have more trouble with this one, and I want to know why you think that was. Probably because I'm not good at these problems. A very discouraging conclusion. Other children show a growth mindset. The growth mindset is like this. No matter who you are, you can always become a great deal smarter. They feel smart when they're working really hard on something difficult and making progress. So if I give you some more problems, would you like more problems like these that are pretty easy so you'll do well, or problems like these that'll be hard but you might learn a lot from them? These. More like these? Students praised for effort generally want those hard ones that they can learn from. What I've learned from my research is that kids, and I think adults too, are exquisitely sensitive to what's going on in a situation, what other people value, what they're being judged on. What is that voice in our head saying? Is it saying fixed mindset things like, oh, you better not make a mistake, you better look smart, people are judging you? Or is it saying growth mindset thing? Here's an opportunity, here's a mistake I can learn from. I feel smart when I do something difficult. So you can see that uh, right in line with what we've been saying is uh, when kids are led to believe they're smart, um, they develop that expectation for being smart. And when they get challenged by difficult problems, they, they get a little defensive and they, they don't want to challenge that uh, mindset anymore that they're smart. So same thing with kids with uh, defensive high self-esteem, think they're great, but uh, when something challenges them, they can get a little, uh, see a little pushback or get defensive in that way. So the uh, very last thing is the self-serving bias. Um, and uh, this is a bias way of viewing the world that serves our self-esteem. And the way this works is, um, of course, it's true 100% of the time, but sometimes our tendency is to uh, attribute our successes to internal factors. So uh, taking credit for getting a good exam score, for example, and saying to yourself, uh, you got the good exam score because you're smart, because you worked hard, because you studied hard. But sometimes in a way to protect our self-esteem, when we fail at something, we'll blame our failures on external attributes or external factors. And then uh, we don't have to uh, uh, blame ourselves, and that way we kind of do protect our self-esteem. So let's say uh, you did poorly on an exam. Uh, instead of uh, blaming yourself, you might blame it on the instructor. Maybe the instructor wrote a poor exam, or the instructor's a bad teacher, or something like that. So, in that way, you take credit for your successes, but blame your failures on uh, things that you have no control over, and uh, you get to uh, maintain a high self-esteem in that way. So, all right, that uh, wraps up this uh, module, and I hope you enjoyed that, and you can uh, move on to the next module when you're ready.